We're still every day in our courtrooms trying to figure out what the reasonable person standard is. But nevertheless, we got the comment. That was comment 1A. And I was uh, excited that they passed that comment. And then when I looked at the rules that were published by the Supreme Court for public uh, comment, comment 1A was removed. I later found out at my next meeting that comment 1A was removed by the Supreme Court. They did not allow the public to see the comment or to comment upon it. I would like to say that that rule is now back before the Supreme Court. I put it back there for them to consider. And actually, I have to, I owe a little bit of uh, gratitude to my opponent. I call it the O'Connor Amendment. I added a small uh, addition to the rule because she had suggested that uh, someone could buy a judge off the, the bench by giving them more than $10,000. I think that's a fair statement. I looked at the Brennan Institute and Justice at Stake and other places around the country that had looked at this issue. And I decided to add an additional rule that would disqualify, uh, when judges disqualify by being bought off the court by give, being given too much money, then the other side who had not given the money could waive the disqualification rule. And that will end that right in its tracks. So no one can take advantage of the new rule to get rid of a judge that they don't want. Uh, my opponent stands strongly in opposition to this program for no apparent reason or no good reason that I can come up with. And I think the time for task forces is over. I think it's time for her to accept it. I think for, it's time for the court to adopt it and that it's time to restore public confidence in this court. Now, I'm going to stop here and reserve time and uh, say quite a bit more in my rebuttal. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Dean Mearn for your participation, agreeing to participate today, and also thank the City Club and its members for providing this forum in this very important race. Sometimes the Supreme Court races are dwarfed, especially in a year where there's a presidential race. And I'm here to talk about the importance of the race. I have had 23 years of public service. I have been a member of the judiciary, a prosecuting attorney, a member of state government, uh, and director of the Department of Public Safety before becoming a justice on the Ohio Supreme Court. As a director of public safety, I partnered with the chiefs of police uh, and the Highway Patrol to develop a program to capture data from traffic stops from all law enforcement in order to address the issue of racial profiling. As a prosecuting attorney, I maintained a policy and a practice of open discovery. As a Supreme Court Justice, I have the distinction of having authored some of the most significant opinions that have come out of the court in the last six years. One of them is Norwood versus Horney, which is a landmark case that preserves the right of the individual property owner in the face of eminent domain takings by government and big business. This issue, or excuse me, this case is nationally recognized as the definitive treatment on the issue and the subject of numerous law review articles as well as included in law school case books, property and constitutional curriculum at such schools as Yale, NYU, Vanderbilt, and of course, Cleveland Marshall. In 2003, justice, or excuse me, balance was restored to the court and predictability in Ohio by the uh, opinion of Westfield versus Galatis. That opinion established a three-pronged test to determine when the Ohio Supreme Court can abandon precedent and stare decisis. That particular case uh, made it impossible for the majority of a court to implement policy and fulfill an agenda and to do so by issuing opinions that would turn Ohio's jurisprudence on its head, such as it had done in the Scott Ponzer case. According to the June 2008 edition of Directorship magazine, in a survey of legal environments of all 50 states, Ohio ranked number four as a state with a Supreme Court that upholds the Constitution and the laws and does so in a manner that allows for stability, predictability, and certainty. The Ohio Supreme Court is a court bound by the rule of law. I don't think there's any higher compliment that can be paid a court. My endorsement by the Greater Cleveland Partnership, a nonpartisan group concerned with issues facing the area, I think highlights the success of our current court. I'm a justice who has developed a reputation for scholarly opinions produced in a record number of days. I have uh, authored the most opinions in 2007 and 2008 in the shortest amount of time, under 110 days from oral argument to release. I'm also regarded as a leader on a court 
as a justice who's in the majority more times than any other justice on the court. I have authored dissenting opinions that, when considered by my colleagues, are so persuasive that it encourages them and allows them to join my dissenting opinions, and those dissenting opinions then become the majority opinion on the case. I very rarely author concurring opinions. Like Chief Justice Marshall, I believe that a court should speak with one voice. I did create an exception to that in the case of the Ohio General Assembly versus Bruner. In that case, I did not comment on the law in my uh, uh, concurring opinion, but rather addressed my good friend, Justice Paul Piper's lack of appropriate judicial restraint in a dissenting opinion that he had authored. I felt that he undermined the integrity of the court and so wrote a concurrence that addressed the tone and the content of his message. In a time when the profession should be concerned with an image uh, both on the bench and the bar of civility, it does no good to have the Ohio Supreme Court author opinions, either majority or dissenting opinions, that undermine that concept. I also feel very strongly that the court as an institution should not be attacked by those who would do so to gain political advantage. According to the League of Women Voters, as you heard my opponent say, 83% of individuals that were uh, uh, surveyed, and that was a survey of 500 people, said that campaign contributions influence judges, uh, and I believe that that figure, although accurate, is taken out of context. And I'd like to tell you what the rest of the figures are. Any good lawyer wants to have all of the data before them before they make their decision. So it's important for you to understand what that survey said and what the, what the conclusions that you can draw from that survey. That survey rated on an A to F scale the performance of local judges at 49% of either A or B and 29% at C. Only 8% did not know how they, would re uh, how they would rate their local judiciary. The Supreme Court received 41% uh, evaluation of either A or B and 29% of C. Significantly, 22% of the, those surveyed had no idea how they would rate the Ohio Supreme Court. When asked to what extent do you feel the overall judicial system in Ohio is fair and impartial, 75% of those surveyed gave a favorable reply and significantly gave the Supreme Court a 72% approval rating. That same survey also cites, and this is interesting, public opinion, the media, personal relationships, and lawyers as factors that influence the judiciary. The survey also demonstrated, and I think this is also very significant, that most Ohioans, over 60%, would continue to opt for the elected judiciary here in the state but that they would favor a reform that included greater transparency. 89% of those surveyed wanted greater transparency uh, with the financial contributions of the judiciary. They want every source of financial support to be fully disclosed. They want the amount, the source, and the occupation of those who would disclose it. There is no doubt that citizens are concerned about the influence of money on our court. In large part, that perception is fostered by rhetoric during the election years. In 1995, based on the recommendations of a citizens committee on judicial elections, the Supreme Court imposed contribution and spending limit uh, amounts for judicial elections as well as the requirement for detailed financial reporting. While the spending limits were declared unconstitutional and they were abandoned in 2001, the court currently has very strict guidelines, or excuse me, very strict mandates on campaign contributions and reporting. According to Canon 7, there's strict limits on the contributions, strict prohibitions about the candidate raising money directly, and strict disclosure requirements for con contributors to judicial campaigns. Currently, the limits that are set for all judicial races are presumed to be reasonable. No state has required its justices to step down from a case in which parties had donated within the limits. Don't misunderstand uh, based on my opponent's uh, statements. I welcome a discussion on the topic, and I believe that all interested parties should be at the table. 